All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. And there may be some latecomers and that's totally fine. Um, before I get too much further putting things on the record, I just want to make you aware that there is a record. The session is being recorded so that it can be helpful for people who are not able to join us this morning. Um, just so you're aware. So let's see, Lindsay Strange is here. She'll be one of our expert presenters this morning. Um, is Tom Oliphant in here yet? I don't see him quite yet. Um, but we'll go ahead and start introductions. My name is Molly Sanford and I'm the Director of Fabrication in the College of Design. Um, I want to go around and introduce the folks who are helping make this conversation possible. So Jonathan, Kate, and Carolyn, if you all could introduce yourselves, um, tell us where you work and what your role is with this conversation, that would be great. And then also, if you have handy a tool or something on your desk that's been particularly helpful or it's been getting a lot of use lately, go ahead and share it. So mine, I've been digging the spring clamp and then also gear ties, which Annie, my coworker, introduced me to. It's just a rubberized piece of wire, but they're so useful. So those are my tools um, that I want to share. So let's go around. Um, we'll do Jonathan, then Carolyn, and then Kate. Thanks, Molly. So yeah, I'm Jonathan Kofel. I'm the Emerging Technology and Innovation Strategist um, in the Health Sciences Library. And I run a bunch of our uh, sort of our maker space in the health sciences and VR space and stuff like that. Um, I am going to be the chat monitor um, of behind the scenes, trying to keep the sort of chat back channel going well uh, during our conversation this morning. Um, and I think my favorite tools, I've got one, a rock that I keep playing with a lot because it's pretty and smooth. Um, I have, cleaning out my freezer, I discovered that I had a bunch of spoon blanks. And so I have my lovely, I have my, uh, my hook knife um, from Pinewood Forge up in Minnesota for carving spoons. And then a slinky. So I'll turn it over to Carolyn. Hey, sorry, I was moving from the notes document to the Zoom window. Um, hi, my name is Carolyn Bishop. I'm the note taker for this session. I'm from the university libraries. Um, I work in Walter Library. Um, part of my job is managing the breaker space, a small maker space with some simple equipment in Walter Library. Um, and uh, I will be furiously taking notes. You may see my three-year-old popping around behind me. Um, and uh, the tool that I, I brought, um, my kids have been wearing out the knees of their pants um, really quickly for some reason. Um, you know, my, uh, my one-year-old is crawling uh, and trying to walk, and so he's rubbing holes in his pants, and my daughter is. So my favorite tool is this um, bent tapestry needle because they wear a lot of leggings, so I need something that has kind of a blunt tip to repair those knit, um, knit clothes, stretch out their lifespan a little bit. All right, off to Kate. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. I'm Kate Martin, co-director at the Center for Educational Innovation. We're a system-wide office that supports the teaching mission of the university. And I want to just thank up front Molly, Jonathan, and Carolyn for your leadership in bringing this session together and finding um, folks to talk about how to do makerspaces and fabrication shops virtually, address the challenges, and identify needs. Uh, my role in this is going to be after the session, taking the, the recording and the notes and trying to pull them together into a resource that's useful for yourselves as well as those who couldn't be here. So thanks again and let's get started. All right, thank you. So welcome to virtual fabrication shops and maker spaces. Some uh, practical things before we get started. You can ask questions using the chat panel if you feel more comfortable that way or if someone's really on a roll telling you something very interesting um, and you want to add to it, use the chat and we'll be collecting all the links, everything you put in there. So um, it might move kind of quickly, but just know that you'll be able to access the information later. Um, so you can unmute yourself at any time. 
or use the chat panel. And as I said to start the session, um, it's being recorded just so folks who aren't here are able to reference it later. And then after the session, if you have something to share, say you've made a training document on how to do paper folding or cardboard fabrication, please add it um, to our shared folder, which you can access through the Z link, z.umn.edu slash virtual fabrication folder. It would also be great to see photos of you in action if you've done any demonstrations or if you've taken screenshots. As I mentioned in the chat, we had, um, we had a spoon carving class over Zoom that was funded by a Campus Climate Micro Grant um, much earlier this year, not intending to be on Zoom, but we did it and it worked pretty well. So I have a screenshot from that that I could share. So things like that are really helpful to see in action how you've been continuing your mission as we're remote. All right, so now, just as a very quick icebreaker, if you're in grid view, who is here from Studio Art? You can raise your hand. Yay, and if you're not sharing video, you can do a thumbs up. Who is here from Mechanical Engineering? Yay, <laughs> who's here from the libraries? Um, College of Design? How about um, bioproducts and biosystems engineering? I thought David was here, maybe not. Um, anyone else that I missed? Miscellaneous places? Um, we are lucky to have some guests from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago here this morning as well. Um, people I know from our professional group of shop managers, um, people from the diversity committee. So. Welcome to them as well. It's great to have um, some more contributors to this conversation. All right, so we'll start out by hearing from some experts. Um, you've become experts very quickly, figuring out how to teach um, making and hands-on activities remotely. And then we have some questions that will open it up to a larger group discussion. So um, we'll hear from Tom Oliphant and Lindsay Strange for about five minutes each. Um, either of you feel ready to go first? Tom or Lindsay? Lindsay? <laughs> so I'm Tom shaking his head. No, so I guess that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for um, kicking us off. Yeah, for sure. Um, to start, should I share my tools that I have on my desk since you asked? <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> yeah, of course. I got excited. I got carried away. I got carried uh, away. Okay. This is my favorite ruler. I know it's a silly thing to have as a favorite thing, but um, I have all my students get these. It's just a two inch, eighth inch grid ruler. I've used it from, it's mostly for pattern making, but I've used it to tile my bathroom. And this weekend I'm going to use it to make some patterns for Adirondack chair arms. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, and then this is my favorite little pair of scissors um, for detail work and sewing and, and just generally making stuff. So. I have a whole desk full of tools, including my sewing machine and everything around me all the time. But um, my name is Lindsay Strange. I'm a apparel design professor in the College of Design, and I teach a lot of our studio um, classes, anything from design process to um, sewing assembly. We call it assembly and construction um, and pattern making, so how you make the shapes that we make our clothes out of. Um, the class I've worked the hardest to, to move quickly online is our freshman apparel design studio where students are kind of for the first time putting together the pieces of the design process, the sewing that they learned the previous semester, and then they're learning to make those, those pattern shapes so they can achieve their very first sort of design prototype. And we were just about to dive into that when uh, the, everything turned over to online really quickly. Um, and a lot of our freshmen don't own their own sewing machines. And so I had to get a little creative about restructuring our assignments to go from expecting a very finished garment prototype at the end of this semester to having a little bit more uh, flexibility to represent something in three dimensions, but be able to show me in some different ways that they were able to understand how to put it together. So um, I guess I have a pretty like, just more stream of consciousness uh, presentation here. Uh, so what the, one of the first things that I did is I surveyed the students um, over spring break about what they had available to them at their homes. Um, and I gave examples of specific things we would need anywhere from, do you own a sewing machine? 
you have basic hand sewing tools, um, kind of getting the range of, of things they had available. Um, things like paper, you know, do you, that seemed like a simple thing, but I realized real quickly, a lot of them actually didn't have access to a lot of that. Um, and then if they had access to things like fabric or any sort of materials um, around their house, just to get a good idea. So that helped me sort of prepare as I adapted the assignments. Um, the next thing I did is once I learned I, about two thirds of my class had a sewing machine. Um, so I, I had a good number of students that didn't. I went back to the assignments we had left and I, I created a sort of structured approach. So they had to create a core deliverable of a very basic prototype that I was open to being made out of anything from paper or cardboard to a fully finished garment. Um, and then I gave them a range of like additional skills they could add on or, or um, complexities they could add to that assignment based on the materials and the equipment they had also so they could sort of tailor the project at this kind of stressful time to be able to focus on a thing they felt more passionate about or really wanted to develop so they didn't have this pressure to do everything all at once they could sort of um, they could focus their their kind of limited energy there um, so then what I did is I just I posted a lot of tutorials I'm kind of a, I'm a self-taught sewer maker hacker <laughs> I don't know what you call it I just love to make things um, so just from my own personal experience, I shared a lot of um, resources ranging from books to blogs to videos. Um, I've made a couple of videos, things like that, um, that I made really available on our Canvas site. And then as things have come up, I've sort of made short, quick um, videos about how to hand sew something or I like grab a garment off of my rack and I walk through how it was sort of put together, um, things that I would try to do normally in person. Um, I think what else that I would do. Um, another thing I did for the students is I started on our Canvas class Canvas page a discussion for sharing resources, and I actually started a weekly discussion post where students would kind of brainstorm, um, finding examples of things they were inspired by to sort of get them out and seeking resources on their own and start to share them with each other. It had mixed success. They did it if I required it, and they didn't do it if I didn't require it. <laughs> um, so I made it worth five points every week for participation, and that definitely boosted it. But we got a lot of, um, it was a good way for students to be able to showcase their own backgrounds and interests and like where their, um, their sort of project interests were. So that was a good way to get them to share anything from what's a sewing technique that you found, um, what's a process, um, documentation that you really liked. So how could you share the way that you're making something or the way that you're working with other people? Um, ways that they like to find instruction that helped me kind of see ways that they like to, to be given information. Um, those things were really helpful. And then I've just tried to provide sort of a range of things, um, you know, from hands-on, one-on-one to like pre-recorded videos. Um, I found overall the most effective thing though has really been the one-on-one. -on -one. And I think that's partly just with the stress of everything happening so quickly. Um, even though I tried to reassure the students we were shifting from this like beautiful finished garment to whatever they could accomplish as best they could, they really needed to be assured like one-on-one. -on -one. And they really needed me to like listen to them and, and hear their ideas and validate them. And I found once I was able to do that with each of them once or twice, their work kind of pushed forward much more quickly. So having them tell me what they had available and be like, but I don't have a serger. I can't finish my seams. And I'm like, I know that not a single one of you own a serger and I don't expect that of any of you. Here's another way we could talk about it. Or here's another way you could show that you would do that if you were really making it. So we worked a lot on like how to um, document their process and, and be able to like pull images off the internet or take pictures of garments they would want to make um, and be able to use that to sort of supplement what they did make. And then I worked with their um, portfolio teacher to kind of integrate that into their work so she could think of creative ways to pull that all together with them. So I, I tried really hard to collaborate across the teachers in that same year so that we were sort of doubling up and in, in giving them the same message. So that really helped a lot. And then um, one assignment that I did that, that I've, is the only one they've turned in so far that had pretty good success, I'd say about half the class did really well with it, is I had them reverse engineer a thing in their own, own home. So I have them normally do this with the Goldstein garment, um, where I have them look at a, a garment from our Goldstein collection, and then they have to figure out how to make the pattern for it. So instead, I just had them go into their own closet, and I had them find an example of a sleeve to really isolate. So these are freshmen, so this is very like, you need to really get down to the, the basics. And I had them isolate this one part of the garment and figure out how they would make the pattern for it 
analyze how it was constructed, diagram all the pieces, articulate it with all the technical language um, and specifications that we've been teaching them, because that's something they can do at home. So then even if they weren't able to do it themselves, they were able to talk through and communicate how it would be done. And then we um, sort of pieced together the way they could best do it at home, whether they were sewing by hand or with their machines. So that's kind of the one assignment. I could show some examples of what they did, if that would be helpful. Um, I see Molly nodding. Okay, I'll share my screen. I can find it here. Sorry, I talk really fast and I get a little nervous, so I'm going at lightning speed. All right, can you all see my screen? Yep. Okay. Um, so I, I can share this later, but this is sort of how I broke down the assignment of like core objectives um, and sort of the process. And then I had these like core deliverables that they had to do. Um, so I had them do a research journal where they documented this analyzing and dissecting process. And then they had to create a pattern, which is something they can do without a sewing machine. If they had pencils and some rulers and some paper, that, that piece they could easily do at home. Um, and then I had them create a test garment of some kind, which is where we got really flexible in what that looked like. And then I called it a digital sample book, which was to be able to show some of the techniques that they would, they would use if they were to make it in real life or in, with the best case circumstances. And then I had this set of optional deliverables. This was a little overwhelming. I had to draft this super fast. I would refine it more in a second round, but um, this was sort of their pick and choose like pick up to 20 points from this menu of things so that they could um, kind of tailor that project to their circumstances and things like that. Um, I gave them an example of ways they could show, like I would do this normally with an industrial machine to create gathers on a garment. This is how I could sew it if I had a home machine. And this is how I could do it if all I had was a hand sewing needle and some thread. So to kind of show them that there's different ways to accomplish a similar, um, thing and still get a good quality product at the other end. Um, this is one of my students' projects that turned out really well. Her name's Shabon. Um, she looked at a garment that she had and she looked at not just the sleeve, she was a little bit of an overachiever, she did the whole thing. Um, but she kind of outlined, like drew over where she saw the seams, where things would go together, where she would sew them. She annotated it with a lot of different types of notes. Um, this is her starting to pull out that inside view, like. How is this thing constructed? What kind of stitches were used? What kind of techniques do I think that I'm finding? And it's a little messy, it's a little kind of scrapbooky, but that's what I wanted them to do was kind of get um, hands-on and, and a little bit more freed up from this like beautiful, um, clean professional document all the time to kind of embrace that like make at home feel. Um, I had them try, I tried to get them to do a mixture of hand sketching and computer sketching and things like that. Cause that when you, they, they draw something themselves, it shows me they really understand it. Um, they kind of showed the research that they did to figure out how to make the thing. Um, so how they were using class resources um, in our textbook in order to um, get to the end result. And then this is the process. So this is like step by step. I asked them to really show me each step of the way so that I could see as their teacher, like how they were thinking and how they were working in a way that I would normally be able to see them doing hands-on. Um, this was really hard to get them to do. Um, they're for a generation that loves social media and Snapchatting their every moment. Like it was amazing to me how hard it is to get them to stop and take pictures of what they're working on. So I had to just remind them constantly. Um, and then a lot of their grade was based on showing me what they were doing rather than like what they actually accomplished at the other end. Um, and then had them take photos and, you know, she used some Photoshop, some students didn't to kind of show me their first test. And you can see it's pretty rough. Like this is not like a beautiful garment someone would wear, but it shows me that she was moving from like looking at a thing, figuring out how to make it. And, and I can see that she's on track to get there. Um, and then she goes through sort of some iterations and does this multiple times till she gets closer. Um, and she ended up with a pretty good garment of what, you know, she was trying to achieve. And again, wouldn't wear this, but it helps me see as her instructor that she's mastering some of the concepts in class. And she has made something with her hands. Um, she was one of the students who had a sewing machine, so she was able to sort of take some of those theoretical like pictures of techniques and, and recreate them. And even if they just did like a small sample to show me they could do it, even if they couldn't do it in like the whole garment. Um, that's one example, and I have a few others, but that was probably one of the better ones. Um, I guess this one I'll show. Some of the students actually took their garment apart um, with a seam ripper, and then they could lay it flat and really, really dig into it. So that was ideal, but not garments that they could do that with. 
Um, so yeah, that's some of the things we did. We also worked in really tiny scale um, where they made little itty bitty things. Like, so if they really were short on fabric, um, you know, I let them work in a smaller scale than they normally would um, or encourage them to. I encourage upcycling of garments, things like that. But anyway, I think I'm way past my five minutes. So sorry, Molly, <laughs> I'll stop sharing. Uh, no, that was great, Lindsay. Thank you so much. And it's so helpful yeah. to see visuals too, because I'm sure most of us are very visual people. Um, so that was that was really helpful. Um, and just some things that you touched on that I want to, I just want to note. Um, so the fact that you surveyed students um, at the beginning of the semester to help you better understand what tools they had available, um, that one-on-ones were the most effective. I found that to be true also, um, that you strategically um, adjusted expectations and really distilled the learning outcomes and were still able to achieve those um, through your flexibility, um, the, embracing the messiness of it all. So you mentioned the scrapbooky kind of feel of showing their work. I think there's a perfection paralysis for students wanting it to, wanting to present some really nice finished thing that they made when really process photos are messy and um, really important for you to know about as an instructor. Um, yeah. So thank you for all those, all those wonderful insights. Um, and now we'll move to Tom Oliphant, who teaches the furniture design course in the College of Design. Good morning, Tom. You're on mute. Oh, yeah. Hey. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Molly. Thank you for the introduction. Thanks for the uh, invitation to be here with you all today. Um, it, I'm, I'm glad to follow Lindsay because she's, she's covered everything and, and all, all I need to do is, um, thank you, Lindsay, all I need to do is just uh, um, kind of reinforce what she said. Um, the, uh, my, my experience, uh, I think, has been easier than Lindsay's in that I'm blessed with a very small cohort. I have 15 students in, in my furniture design classes. And uh, they are second semester juniors and seniors. And so they are really high functioning university students. Um, they, got, they got all the skill set that you all have helped to give them. And, um, and my, successes, uh, are, uh, my successes are because of that. Um, the, I, just to, uh, to kind of reiterate, uh, my success, or my, I guess, the, the the part that I've played in the success has been um, that uh, I've been able to reframe or maybe just kind of emphasize what I actually think is the the core uh, the core trait of every uh, every design practice, which is resourcefulness. And and so I emphasize or what I have been doing um, to um, kind of negate this. Uh, desire for perfection uh, or this expectation of perfection is just to um, uh, remind everybody that at the, the core of every design uh, is, uh, is a sense of resourcefulness, assessing what is available to you, um, uh, the time that you have, the parameters that you are working within, um, and um, not so much uh, downplaying the expectations for the final uh, the final result, but uh, just um, maybe it, the one thing I do reframe is I I guess I'm just suggesting that uh, that the 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 kit of thinking that they're applying to the project is um, uh, working with the smallest uh, the within the smallest tightest most challenging parameters that that you could uh, that you would ever be um, uh, faced with. I, I have to say that uh, one of the other things I, I just discovered the other day um, is that one of my students uh, is um, uh, retired, uh, or not retired, but a, yeah, I guess a retired Air Force vet, and his role within the Air Force was uh, survival training. And uh, so he took uh, flyers, uh, groups of flyers everywhere in the world, and they were dropped off on uh, ice flows and in mountains and and on desert islands and he taught them how to survive with nothing and so uh, Matt has has been just completely cool and unflappable in 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 the face of all of this and is 
uh, done great work and, and uh, kind of demonstrated how easy it can be. Um, and, I, and I was just, uh, I was kind of really tickled and thrilled to, to learn of his past experience dealing with adversity that was much greater than anything that we're dealing with today. Um, so, um, so kind of, I, again, um, I, I digress, but to kind of reform my thoughts here, um, uh, the, the, uh, just reminding the students, challenging them to understand what, what the nature of a, of a design practice is, um, uh, that again, it's about resourcefulness and the way to, uh, to kind of, um, uh, force them or entice them to deal with ideas and um, we make what we call our I call them prototypes or proofs of concepts um, things that aren't necessarily finished um, but that demonstrate an idea sufficient enough that we can talk about it and um, that they in the future could move forward when they get that uh, development money um, from the big corporation or from the um, from from the investors to uh, to make the thing perfect eventually uh, the thing that i've learned is that i've had to provide a lot of extra content um, because the students aren't hanging out with each other i've had perfect attendance um, during the quarantine and um, i'm pretty used to having my students especially in the end of the semester triage their uh, their class time with me in order to um, to be responsible uh, to their other coursework. Um, but that has been um, completely uh, not the case this semester. Everybody shows up at nine o'clock and they stay till noon. And the reason is simple is that they're, they're just, they're so hungry for the social time. They wanna see their friends, they wanna be with their friends. Um, I, I mean, they, in, they enjoy me, um, which is, you know, really flattering. And um, and what I realized fairly early on is that they're not they're not hanging out together, and and so there there's no interspecies conversation that's happening in the workshop with Molly's crew. Um, there's no interspecies conversation that's happening up in the um, up in their in their um, their studios or their labs or um, you know, at the cafes or bars afterwards when they're, when they're socializing. And so I'm having to present a lot of the things that get them to switch, um, uh, to, or to kind of switch off of the, the, the path that's they're on and, and explore something new. So I've just been making kind of photo dump, uh, stream of consciousness things based on, um, uh, what, um, what's said in the classroom and, uh, and then sharing it the next day, um, or this, ne the next class period, just to, um, to begin to link their thinking in ways that, um, that they might be doing naturally. And it's just frankly taken a lot of effort. And I, I don't know, I don't know if I can, I mean, I don't really know if I can put this kind of energy into it uh, on a on an ongoing basis in the fall. And and again, I'm only teaching one course this semester and not three. Um, it kind of uh, it does. I think my success, at least, has required a lot of uh, a lot of extra effort on my part um, to um, incite thinking um, that that's beyond. Um, what uh, what would normally happen on the campus. Um, yeah, I just want to jump in here, Tom, and I think this would be a good time to open up the conversation to, to see if others have found ways to successfully build that sort of collaborative environment with students working remotely, or if people see, see a gap in technology and how maybe that could help us build collaboration too. So, if you've done anything with students that's helped build that sort of sense of community, because that is so important to, to what our spaces provide. Um, yeah, I just wanna open up the conversation if anyone's had successes with that. Thanks, Molly, I think that's a great idea. Or if there's any kind of specific things that maybe we can all talk about uh, 
specific cases. I, I know in my studios, some of my students have been setting up their own Zoom meetings and kind of congregating together and working on projects together in their own spare time, which I think has been really helpful outside of studio. Um, the other thing is I've just been, even, even though we might not have time, like I might not be lecturing the whole time, we kind of sit, I sit with them till the entire time and we talk about anything and everything and just a lot of questions come out that way. Like uh, we kind of talk about, you know, I, I put out polls about funny things just to get them talking and engaged. Like one kid was, uh, my class is from six to nine at night. So they'll be eating dinner. So then we'll ask questions like, what kind of dipping sauce should you eat with your chicken fingers just to get them engaged. And we do polls and it gets them, you know, loosened up and makes them feel like they're part of a family. And I think they enjoy having the engagement and the socialization. And then they start to ask questions about, oh, how might I make this model differently? Or I thought about doing this and, you know, try this technique. And, and that kind of starts the conversation and gets them comfortable in a way that they weren't comfortable previously. Yeah. For the uh, social aspect of things, has anybody tried using um, a, tools like, uh, like Slack or Discord, where it's not necessarily like a video call thing, but it's more of a just sort of like a text record of what's going on. I feel like something like that might be a good way for people to sort of feel like they can contribute throughout the day uh, to the conversation and post links and such. Um, maybe that's also a feature of like Canvas or something, but uh, it's just a bot. Uh, spe speaking from my library, we all got very excited about Slack, I think in the first couple weeks and um, and, and it was great, you know, people were sharing, you know, pet photos and pictures of their tea and advice for how they're working. But over time, that's kind of tapered off. Um, and I know in some communities that Slack has kept going, um, but I'm not, I'm not sure what the secret sauce is to create a really cohesive or, or sort of self-supporting self Slack community. It, it's a good idea that I think are having more of those asynchronous kind of back channels or asynchronous um, methods. Yeah, we use a Slack channel with our um, student workers. Annie or Justin, do you want to talk a little bit about how Slack works for our team? We can't hear you, Justin. Annie's ready to go. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, I, I was thinking of that when you mentioned Slack. We have a channel that's just called Work in Progress that our student workers have. And it's been pretty successful. I would say most people post in it like once or twice a week, kind of for their shift that they would be working. And they say, here's my longboard I made, my electric longboard, or, you know, it's funny how some of it has been like just home projects, like raised garden beds and things like that and some of it has like changed in different ways where I feel like I don't know if I'm just imagining this but I feel like some of the women were contributing like more at first and now it's like more of the men are contributing more but I, I might be imagining that but it just is interesting how like what people show on it as their success you know what I mean because they want to I think it's not always like um, as much of a work in progress. It's a lot of times it kind of feels like on the finished end. I don't know, but that's what I've been noticing about it. There have been some photos of a sourdough starter that keeps dying. So that's been a good um, process image to watch. And I wonder too, if that's something that we can demonstrate as instructors um, as how to show your own failure through this. Cause I think that's another pressure that we have using technology like Zoom, you want to feel really polished or you want to have time to make training videos that look really good, but we don't have time. So how can you work really quickly to get something out there and recognize that it's not perfect, but it's the situation that we're all in. So I'm curious if anyone has shared any, any of their own process or anything scrappier that you normally wouldn't share. 
definitely uploaded tutorials where my four-year-old interrupts me in the background and I'm like, go eat a snack. <laughs> then I just keep going because I don't have time to edit it. So the students see him every single day, shows them his Lego creations. And like, that's sort of like a clear way that's like, I'm not perfect. This, my situation is chaotic. I can't concentrate for more than five minutes at a time, usually when I'm home alone. And so I think seeing that, like I had a student who was talking and her dog barked and she got really nervous and like muted really quick. I was like, it's totally fine. <laughs> like you've all met, you know, my son and my cats. And, and so I think it just took a little time. They got a little more used to it. Um, but I think just having that like real life, like this is, I'm dealing with it too, um, seems to have helped a little bit. Yeah, I think trust building is, uh, happens through just being completely messy and open and allowing that to happen. Um, I don't know, uh, I, again, I don't know if, if it, it's gonna continue to be as fun, air quotes, as it is now next fall when it becomes the, the normal. Um, but I've written down, I've got all the pets' names in my attendance book and, and I check on Doug and Zeke and Pep and, and um, they're a part of the class as well, as well as the, the, human, the human babies that are showing up, Riley in his jumper seat. So uh, yeah, I think that what Lindsay says is exactly right. Um, it's just kind of embrace the mess and be open and a wreck with your students when it happens. And they'll really appreciate that. Uh, and I think respond uh, positively back. I've showed uh, I've shown my students uh, they they like to have the lecture recorded, and so I make recorded videos. But I've showed shown them the process of taking a tutorial on a software that I'm narrating while I'm doing it, um, and showed them the process of converting that to a video where I edit out all of the ums and the ers and the pauses and you know the the I feel like if you're going to have a student watch a video or if they want to watch a video, it, sh it shouldn't be full of all of that sort of human error, but maybe that's just, just me. Um, live presentation, sometimes you're, you, you lose your train of thought, but I think a recorded video, if you can edit that, but, I've, but students have asked, when, when is this video going to be uploaded? And I show them the process that, Editing that video takes time. Yeah. I mean, I think, oh, excuse oh, me. Go, go ahead, Annie. Oh, I just think that that's also great too. I feel like a diversity of a, approaches is the, the best way for this. So I think all methods are um, useful and refreshing for the students to see, I'm sure, so. And we're all experimenting and figuring it out as we go. Um, so I'm wondering if, so Tom mentioned that if we're doing this in the fall, it's not going to be fun anymore, but I wonder if, if you went into fall knowing it was going to be online, how could you be intentional about setting the tone with students and the expectations? Like what kinds of things would you want them to do? Would you first get them to figure out how to set up a workspace for making or what sorts of ways could you help support them? initially i think that the I, i'm just going to jump in right now um my students need uh they they've all set up a, a, st a studio space uh or a a, a tv studio uh, as it were uh they've got a curtain or something that uh a bed sheet that's draped that makes a very crude sweep that they can put their object on and then uh, they either synchronize their phone with the Zoom platform or they um, just swing their camera around conveniently. Molly's made the video that shows how to, how to do that. And um, I think that's a, that's a real critical tool for them is that they need a, they need a TV studio, they need a video production um, uh, place. And, and that, uh, Lindsay showed that example of, of having the camera over the table, that would be another example of, of you know, strapping your phone onto a Luxo lamp or something like this and just aiming it straight down on your desk so that you can either draw, demonstrate, cut, paste in live time 
um, on a on on a work surface, um, or you know how you know wherever that and however that thing is that you need to demonstrate. Um, yeah, I just want to jump in because I think Annie, do you have your mending cam set up? Yeah, there you go. Can you show us what that? Yeah, sure. Looks like. So um, here you can see is my phone just like on a couple dowels on a lamp. And so I can adjust it. And you, if you're in gallery view, mending cam is one of the options. And so I can adjust this as needed. And then I made like um, kind of a larger than life version of this so people can see like what stitches these are like with a high contrast because a lot of times when people are mending something I host a mending clinic twice on Mondays um, you can't see it very clearly and I can't show them very clearly unless it has high contrast so to show them what an invisible stitch looks like I can show them on this um, so yeah that's been good and it's nice we haven't, I haven't had a lot of students, just a few students, but some staff and um, some students have come and it's been a good way to just um, kind of chat. It really has been like an easy way to just chat and hang out and make, make something. So that's been like a successful way of bringing people together that is like more casual. But I don't have like the pressure of like a syllabus, you know, so it's it's been nice yeah so that's a just an open making session which is really in line with what we do in our shop we're just an open shop and we're ready we wait for people to come to us so um we're having to do a little more outreach to try to get to the students and the people that we're not that it's harder to connect to now um could you post a link to mending monday annie and then anyone else if you're doing any sort of programming if you could post it, that would be really helpful just so we can um, take a look. Um, I also think, so Tom talked about you having students set up their own little TV studio and that's, that's definitely how I feel. I have to take more videos of myself, which is not the most comfortable thing for me. Um, and it takes effort, but um, I feel like that's an area where some help with like in the College of Design, we have Sam in the Imaging Lab, who's great and probably have some good ideas about helping us and Clay. So what are some kinds of um, resources that would help with that? I mean, having a place to put your camera, but if you're thinking big or getting dreamy, I was thinking it'd be nice to have a little drone that just follows me so I don't have to worry about connecting my phone to a thing. But um, how can we start to solve that problem? I don't know, or what technology could be helpful? So Annie, um, is your mending cam, um, do you link that into our conversation? Uh, because uh, you just dial in the meeting code on the Zoom app on your phone and it joins us just like another person would join us. Is that, is that how your mending cam is here with us today? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. so I just have two devices. Yeah. So the, you know, the, some of my students do that and that seems to work better than the, the screen share option where you just jack your phone um, in directly into your computer and then, uh, and then share it. Um, Tom, I, I, uh, I'm using a, um, a wise cam. It's like a security camera. You think about like home security, you have a camera in the front and the camera in the back and you're vacationing and you want to see what's happening. Yeah. So they're IP cameras, but you can, um, you can share that camera video stream. You can view it on any iOS or Android device, but I use a Windows emulator, uh, uh, so it emulates Android. So these are like $20 cameras, but, but you're talking about like a studio setting i mean that would be expensive but but these um ip cameras network cameras you can have several of them and just show the video stream fairly inexpensively so i i i think it's a nice maybe an inexpensive way for you to have multiple video streams 
I just find it tiresome to just be staring at a camera all the time. And I think for students, it's, yeah. it's, you know, you just, you don't do that normally. You, you might look somewhere else. So having a different, like the mending cam, having a different, just somewhere else for you or your students to put their, their focus for a change of pace. Right. Yeah, exactly. This, this raises a, a question for me. I mean, I see questions about um, everyone putting together their own setups and wondering how to get um, multiple different video streams. What kind of sort of tech support do people need? I mean, are people working with sort of instructional designers or academic technologists in their units? Um, and I know uh, there was an official question. Yeah, what, what are the... Um, what are the kinds of activities or the remote making process you'd like to find better technology solutions for? I don't know if this is a technology solution, but how can we pull away from screens more and continue work? Because we've all expressed that it's so draining to be on screens, but how can we build community and work more in the physical world, because that's what we're asking students to do, is do physical making. Um, and that's not a balance that they're getting right now. So maybe pulling away from technology in a way, but still being able to instruct, I don't know. And, and Molly, can I ask too, I mean, I think that in the registration form, a lot of you um, posted questions that have been addressed already in the discussion and the idea sharing, but there are some questions about some of the logistical like how do we have students make um, and fabricate things without the right equipment or without the equipment that they have on campus? And I just wonder if people have specific questions that you'd like to bring to this really smart group um, on how, you know, how to make your particular instruction go forward. I hop in with something we've been talking about in apparel. Um, we're, we're thinking about if we have to teach sewing online next in the fall, could we pre-cut kits? Of, like we often pre-cut them things and give them to them at school. So could we do that and send them out a big package at the beginning as like part of their course pack? Um, or could we gather material donations and get them to the students in some way, um, in a way that we would normally try to do? Because um, I think like right now everything it's there's like they can't even get to stores or like order fabric online and have it show up dependably. So like we've had to be really flexible. But I think going forward some of those things might you know, if we might need to organize them. Because one thing I've really noticed about this process is it's made the inequity of students' different situations really, really apparent. Um, and there are students who have their own sewing machine, they have their own room, they're like at their parents' house and they have all the, you know, things they need to like be successful and safe. And then we have students who are one of six siblings and are sharing the internet with everyone during the day for school and like they don't have a quiet place to work and asking them to set up a workstation is kind of impossible. Um, so I think it, anything we could do to provide or build that sort of, even if it's building that fee into our course fees to provide that, um, I think that could help. Of course, that only goes so far because sometimes you need tools and like that's a big investment, um, things they're normally able to share. So I don't know if we could even come up with like a bare bones like maker kit that we suggest. Like we have a sewing kit we have them get, but like could we expand that a little bit so that they're more set up at home? I don't know what other folks have found. But. Yeah, I think I heard that the, uh, the physics labs in uh, College of Science and Engineering mailed out a kit to students because um, that was still doable. It's a little harder to do with like the chemistry lab, but uh, physics was doable for sure. Um, yeah, I think that's interesting. I, I've also been wondering, um, I manage a space that students do a lot of 3D printing, um, and I guess I don't really know what the, the timeline is for opening things up at all, but I could, I could easily imagine, you know, having some sort of job shop approach where, you know, like one staff person is there to make the, the files that students um, submit and then just like mail them out to students or set them in a bin somewhere. Um, but obviously I think that's a sort of a higher up decision. Yeah, I've been thinking about uh, the same things as Ben running um, the XYZ lab in the art department and, and shifting the thought, you know, as we evolve to like more of a service bureau where students can submit files virtually, one person can be working in the shop or lab at a time to kind of 
run their parts and then yeah some sort of mailing system or curbside pickup of those projects um and i do think that could reflect i mean obviously the experience of running the machines themselves is gone but as they graduate and go into the real world oftentimes it is more of the file prep and sending it out somewhere anyhow um and then these other places will make it for them so um, i could see that translating at least as a, a band-aid um, for a solution I have a um, question. My name is Katrine. I'm from the School of the Art Institute. Molly kindly invited me and a couple of my other colleagues were on a committee together for um, an organization called SSMC, which is um, basically university um, shops across the country. Um, so the facility I run at the School of the Art Institute is um, we're, we're only an art school, so we don't have these other um, departments that it sounds like your university has. And the department I facilitate is um, the entire freshman or incoming student body, which is about 850 students. And part of the curricular requirement for that department is to go through um, authorizations, which are mini courses. Maybe you guys have these as well. It's a safety course on basic usage and safety of tools. So we have one for the wood shop. We have them in the metal shop. We have them for 3D printers for a wide variety of things. But this department requires the wood shop authorization. And so that means my staff and I, over the course of a year, authorize 850 students, which usually is about 55 wood shop authorizations a year. It's very time consuming. Um, and with social distancing potentially, or I'm assuming will be in play for the fall, um, I'm trying to imagine how that will happen and what, um, how maybe the department might transform its curriculum to still include that type of making in its curriculum um, or how we could logistically facilitate it. And I'm curious if any of you have um, any ideas or thoughts about that. No. <laughs> I think for us, the conversation has been focused about focused on, you know, so if we're still remote in the fall, what does that look like? And we haven't been talking as much about, you know, if we return, what kinds of measures will we be taking? Um, but yeah, maybe if folks have ideas, you can pop those in the chat or reach out to Katrine. Um, thank you all for such a wonderful discussion. There's clearly so much to talk about and you all have so many great resources, things that you've created or learned from working with your students um, or articles that you've referenced. I just want you um, to know about the folder that we have which we have shared a link to. Um, I think it's just really important to continue these conversations and work really collaboratively, figure out ways that we're, we can all collaborate throughout our discipline so that we're not all starting from scratch with everything because remote learning takes a lot of effort um, and a lot of creative solutions. So if we could continue sharing our solutions and continue our conversations and reaching out to one another throughout um, this network, I think that that would help us all so tremendously because we're not, we don't all need to be figuring everything out by ourselves in our basement, even though that's what it feels like sometimes. Um, so if you could um, please give feedback for the event as well. Um, anything else, Jonathan, Carolyn, or Kate, you wanna add about um, continuing the information sharing? Uh, not for me. It's, it's just been, a, I think, a great conversation. And I would encourage people, I'm, I'm trying to gather as many of these documents and links, but um, if you think of others, please drop them in there um, in either a links document or um, in the actual folder proper. Um, but no, this, this has been great. All right, could we post the link one more time in the chat um, for the folder where people can share resources? Thanks, Ben. 
Yeah, thank you, everyone. I would add, um, you know, one of the things we, because the, the Executive Vice President and Provost Croson asked um, the Center for Educational Innovation to convene these sessions, we are um, so grateful for all of you taking the time to be here and share your ideas and ask your questions and all of the resources that you've shared. We are also um, thinking about running another one of these sessions um, in the summer um, or late May or when we know what the plan is for fall so that people can say, okay, now that we have more clarity, um, as much clarity as we can get at this time, um, let's talk again and continue to share ideas and we may have new individuals who join us. So could, could people just put a quick note in the chat, either a yes, that sounds great, or any information you have about like when would be a good time to do the next session. Uh, just a quick kind of crowdsourcing of whether you have interest in something like that for this topic again. Um, and again, thank you to, to everyone, and especially to Molly, Jonathan, and Carolyn, um, to Tom and Lindsay for sharing your expertise, and to everyone for sharing resources. Very grateful. I'll add to that um, we do have a group on campus called FLASH, which is Fabrication Leaders and Shop Heads, um, which is co-chaired by myself and Karen Hazelman from Studio Arts. We've been sort of dormant as um, we've been scrambling to figure out this semester, but I think that would be a really useful place also to meet informally and chat about these issues and then um, have productive conversations with the Center for Educational Innovation as well so that we can document it and um, get feedback and collect ideas. But, but also let's, um, let's continue these conversations through that group. So if you would like us to add you to that mailing list, we can come up with um, times to meet. I'll just post my email address in the chat. Um, so. Anybody can join that, even if you don't identify as a fabrication leader or shop head. Um, all right. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to voluntarily add another hour of Zoom meetings to your busy schedules. Um, it's really been a, a really great time to connect with you all. So thank you all.